Hello and welcome to A Bite Of. I am Noah and I'm joined here with my always signing on my dance card partner, Derek. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to be talking about Doctor Who, episode six, Rogue, our sixth bite into this new Doctor Who season. There's lots to talk about with this one. I feel like I say that every time. I hope there's lots to talk about every time we do this. I think this. we talk a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but, so that proves the point. Yeah, but not too much. Before we get into everything, I'm just going to get this out of the way so we can jump right into the episode. Make sure you're following us. Make sure you're subscribed to us. If you're watching us, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. We have a Patreon. It's Pride Month. Support queer indie creators like us. Go on Patreon and do it. What were you looking for? I... I I just remembered at work, I have a rainbow fan. I don't have it here. Oh, I was hoping to grab it and do it, but I don't have it. I need a home fan. So please support us. <laughs> wow. So you just, pro- <laughs> you just said something that they're not going to get. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'll have to tune in next week. Okay. So all <laughs> that great stuff. Um, spoilers ahead for Doctor Who this entire season so far. And especially for Rogue. Yes, so let us officially take a bite of Doctor Who Episode 6, Rogue, directed by Ben Chessel and written by Kate Heron and Bryony Redman. The Doctor and Ruby land in Bridgerton-inspired 1813, where there's etiquette, dancing, a handsome bounty hunter, and shape-shifting bird-like lightning-producing cosplayers. Scandals abound. Where's Lady Whistledown when you need her? Oh, writing about the scandal well she better be there because there was a lot happening at this place where's penelope i did not see her well she's a little wallflower you never see her that's oh, the whole point very good point what would i have done if nicola coglin would have come out of the wall as one of those bird people it would have been amazing you know she is going to be the companion for this year's christmas special so look at that connection is that true yeah why would i lie to get my hopes up <laughs> hello <laughs> i would Never lie about Nicola Cockla like that. I mean, she's amazing. Yeah. No, she is for real. Um, so surprise if you didn't know that. A spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> Out of a lot of these episodes that we've seen from like the season trailer and everything, this is one of the ones that was at the top of my list mm-hmm. that I was so excited for. Not just for the Bridgerton of, of it all, but I love time period pieces for Doctor Who. So it just checked multiple boxes. What are your thoughts on this episode? General thoughts before we get into the nitty gritty. Thoughts? I have more questions than thoughts. My question is, where does this fit into the season? What does love mean to the doctor? Who is Ruby Sunday? (laughs) And what's the deal with Susan Twist? (laughs) (laughs) That's it. That's all the thoughts. That's all the thoughts I have. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I... (laughs) Those are season questions, and I feel like this one being right before the penultimate, right before the kind of two-parter finale, is an interesting choice, but I thought it was a lot of fun. We almost needed it, because the last couple episodes were really heavy, almost. So, And this one wasn't? Well, I mean, it was like hot and heavy, but... Not that ending. We needed some like levity almost. There was dancing. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of dancing with this. <laughs> <laughs> That's the joy of anything Bridgerton. It's the costumes and the dancing. And this delivered both. Yeah. What did you think of the fact that it was, they were like in Bridgerton, but not necessarily 1813? Okay. So thoughts gone into the episode. I well, it, the year doesn't matter to me. I'm like, fine, do whatever year you want. You can go to 42, 69, 26. I don't care. Time. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> Timey wimey. <laughs> Thanks for pointing out my mistake. <laughs> um, no, I, I liked it. Again, I like the period pieces with this. I am really interested on why we're getting episodes like this. They, the only really through line is the Doctor and Ruby, which is most of Doctor Who. And Susan Twist, but each one, it almost, this episode made me feel like it's out of order. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why I'm feeling that way. And maybe we'll know if that's something that's happening, but it almost does feel out of order. And I don't know how to put a pin in that. Do you feel that in any way? Or 
I just felt like this episode out of all of them, we lost a lot of those through lines that we have been talking about this entire season, right? Of sort of music playing a part in it. I mean, granted there was dancing, but there wasn't like music wasn't encompassing any of it. Um, there was like pop hits. That I mean, were... that is true, but I don't know. It feels like where's the, as far as the babies or parents, or I don't know. I felt like as far as it being a main part of this storyline, it wasn't there. Even Susan Twist in this one, she was a painting on a wall and that's all we got of it. But she was a grandmother. Right. So there's your <laughs> familiar connection there. I mean, I, I think so. Doctor Who is interesting because it is very like episode of the week, but there is a through storyline. Right. And so I am curious to see if there is a connection between Ruby almost manifesting things that are happening in episodes like Mm -hmm. in the devil's court. Oh, you know, where's like the dance numbers and the jives? There's one at the end. You know, this is very Bridgerton. It literally became Bridgerton with the quartet pop music instrumentals. We got um, what was it? Poker Face and Bad Guy by Billie Eilish. Mm -hmm. Laid in this one. And all of that stuff happens almost after she puts it into the universe. Almost. This is, she said in this episode, this was always a dream of mine and it's becoming a reality. So I don't know if it's, we're supposed to be picking up on those things, but I do find it interesting that it is almost like we are already on the planet or wherever they are. They're already there and it is whatever happens. Mm -hmm. And she almost like she, the fairy circle, it became a fairy tale. I don't know. It's just, it's interesting. I'm trying to put together pieces, but I feel like I will go insane if I keep trying to connect everything. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right in the sense that each of these episodes sort of does feel like it's very own genre, like, or like like it's hitting a specific genre, right? So this is exactly. So this is where instead of being in Disney plus, we're in Ruby plus, right? And we're just going through her subscription based (laughs) streaming service. And so this week we were in Bridgerton you know, the week before we were in sort of a Black Mirror episode, the mirror, you know, before that we were in a horror or whatever it is, space babies. So I think you're hitting something uh, on the head there where it does seem like they are, although there is the through line of the Doctor and Ruby, they're going through very different places, which I know is part of the show, right? They travel to different places, but a lot of the times it does feel very based in in science fiction yeah there's just i almost feel like there's some things that are missing almost and that's what's giving me pause because i I was we've been watching some episodes i've been making you watch some episodes that are my favorite and we watched some of the ones with amy pond and um and matt smith and everything amy, i said the character's name and the actor's name you guys know what Interchangeable. I'm talking about. um there's too many names to keep track of but there's something that like what I feel like is missing. And I just thought of it now is the doctor being like, okay, pressing all the buttons, doing all the levers and going to the place. And that happens most of the time, Mm. not all the time, but it happens. And I feel like we haven't seen that at all, really this season before everything kicked off. So there's like things that I feel like are missing that I don't know if it's by choice or they're just omitting it for like runtime. Like, are we just cutting to the chase of them being there? Right. Because there's only eight episodes a season where usually there's like 13. So I don't know. I'm just like throwing theories out there. It's towards the end. I'm going crazy. I need some answers. Yeah. (laughs) And I think it's interesting. Is, is the mystery just Ruby herself or is the mystery this entire season? I think both. I think they're tied together. They would have to be. It's going to be interesting. So Susan twist is really just a producer at Ruby Plus, and she's pulling all the strings. <laughs> it could be. It could be. <laughs> so this episode, what did you think about the Bridgerton-ness of it? I love it. And I mean, I think the timing is perfect, right? We're kind of in the middle of season three of Bridgerton right now. We're waiting for that second half, which comes out next week. So the Bridgerton-ness of it, I think we are all Ruby, right? We are Ruby living in this reality where we can't wait for the next season of Bridgerton to come. And the things that she loves about it, you know, the amazing costume designs in this episode, the choreography, which is done by the same choreographer who choreographs Bridgerton. That's insane. Yeah, it's it's pretty fantastic. So uh, his name is Jack Murphy. He's done all three seasons of Bridgerton and he's done a couple episodes of this Doctor Who, uh, which is very cool to see. And so I think that as far as the Bridgerton ness of it in thinking about them being in Bridgerton, it totally pays off and they pull, totally pull it off. The one thing that I'm trying to piece together, not to get back into the theory of what's happening here, is 
it, it feels like they're actually in an episode of Bridgerton, not that they're doing what Bridgerton does, which is like, you know, Bridgerton is like taking the Regency era, but making it more modern. It's like they actually went into Bridgerton itself rather than them just putting a twist yeah. on the era. I feel like the writing duo that wrote this episode were the perfect people to do this um, because when an episode of TV tries to clearly emulate something and they even drop the name of the thing they're trying to emulate, it could get tiring really quickly. But I felt like with the writing with this, I mean, Kate Aaron, we know them from Loki season one. They, they were the reasons why Loki season one was so good. I mean, there's obviously tons of other people, but they were the creative mind behind that. And I felt like the writing was so sharp in this episode. The jokes weren't like heavy handed. Mm. They were quick and witty um, and just kind of like there. And it's like, oh, that was that was funny. And it just seemed a little natural. So having that tight writing in this paid off with it emulating another show. And I feel like it didn't get tired. I was enjoying a bunch of it. Yeah. And I really loved the scenes personally between uh, Ruby and the character Emily Beckett, who's supposed to be like the shy wallflower character. I love Ruby just being Ruby, even though Ruby is dressed up in Bridgerton attire. She's still saying current vernacular. She's still acting like herself. And so watching this character get very wide eyed by everything that she's saying, I thought was really funny. And I thought they played off of each other really well. Yeah. I liked it. And there's, you know, injecting that modern feminism into mm-hmm. it. And even though we do find out that this character is a shoulder, which I'm going to say we had a hard time pronouncing that at first because we didn't really catch it in this show. And then I know in the like the spoiler sheet that we got because we saw this episode early, they were like, don't mention blah, blah, blah about the shoulders. And I was like, how do you say that? I didn't expect it to be spelled that way. It was way. spelled quite bizarrely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, but so finding out that she was that but she was still from like a time not in current time so it was interesting to see an alien deal with that vernacular as well but also having ruby there to inject the like oh this isn't right yeah let's let's not do this i love that she calls that one jerk lord stilton and then he's like stilton and and then the duchess says it's a very difficult cheese so funny that was really funny so funny (laughs) because at first i was like that's his name i didn't it's so early in the episode, but when she said that, I was like, oh, it was a dig. Yeah. Good exactly. job, Ruby. And I love that it's explained as well. It's a very difficult cheat. Yeah. <laughs> Ruby and the doctor in this episode, it was really good to see them together again for a longer period of time because it's been like three episodes almost where like we, you know, Ruby was sleeping and boom. And then the doctor was gone in 73 yards. And the last one, they were just FaceTiming in. Um, So it was nice to see them, even though they did get separated in this episode. I loved the moments where they were just like, she was, oh my God, like, this is so cool. And there's that thing with the doctor where like the companion that he's taking to these places, they would have never gone to. And there's that spirit in him, that thing that just like radiates, like, this is why I do this. Mm -hmm. You know, I save people and help people, but like, I get to show people all these wonders that they would have never seen before. And in this particular episode, it seems like they weren't there because the Childers were there. They were there because they just wanted to go to Bridgerton. They got an invite to Bath, England in 1813. And they were like, sure, let's go. Let's do it. I mean, (laughs) let's pop in our little earbuds that will, you know, let us know all the dances in the vernacular and we're Mm -hmm. good to go. Yeah. And it was nice to see them just having fun. Yes. It was for the first, you know, five minutes of the episode. But it was nice to see them enjoying each other because that's the thing, right, is that In every season of Doctor Who, we're very invested in the relationship between the Doctor and the Companion. So we need to see them together in order to see that grow. Right. And I'm very happy for this episode, even though Ruby and the Doctor weren't together a lot. This episode with the titular name Rogue had this new character at the heart of it and the Doctor right along with that. And I felt like because we got 73 yards with Ruby and we really got to know her a little more, see her more. We got to see this layer of the doctor from Nshuti's way that we haven't seen yet. What did you think about Rogue and the doctor? Well, I mean, it's Pride Month, so I fully support it. (laughs) I will say (laughs) every episode of Doctor Who is gay at some level. This one, 
real gay. Oh, yeah. So gay. I mean, it had Kylie Minogue in it. <laughs> I literally, hold on. Let me find this in my notes because I, I wrote in my notes, <laughs> Kylie Minogue in all caps. That's one way to tell if somebody's gay. <laughs> I mean, and not even that, but just the doctor just fully body rolling the entire time while it's playing. Ugh. I mean, it's, it's like that hidden playlist that you don't want anyone to know about. And then they play it and blast it. Did he ever think that there would be this Time Lord temporal being that came into his ship and would play his playlist the one that he paused right <laughs> and that was the song he that landed on. he's like but when i score this bounty i'm playing kylie minogue and i'm dancing the hell out of this absolutely his face when it came on jonathan cross face rogue's face was just like <laughs> <laughs> oh no no i do have to say i loved the it, there was no tiptoeing into this Right. It was very much brooding on the balcony, the doctor going up there and them just immediately, I don't know, some sort of space traveler signals of letting each other know that they were into each other. It, it was really interesting because one, Jonathan Groff, I feel like did an amazing job. And I hope he becomes a fan favorite because I would love to see more of this character. I don't know how, because he's the doctor's going to have to go find him. I hope he comes back because there is an element of like other characters in the Hooniverse that we don't have anymore at this point. And so having this character that like is a little horny with the doctor and just like pops in and out, but adds that like bounty hunter aspect of it is so good. Don't Not I know pops I, in and out. Noah, <laughs> this is a family program. <laughs> There's an E next to this episode. Okay. <laughs> explicit. Yeah. What was explicit about it? What? Our episodes. Oh, our episodes. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Rogue? No. What did I miss? Yeah. So I, you know, there's that element that I'm, that is missing a little bit. Like we don't have Captain Jack anymore. And my hopes was this could be the new Jack, but with that, like kind of budding romance or at least attraction, I wouldn't necessarily say full on romance, but like, that's interesting. That's new. And I like it. Well, that was my question for you was. As uh, Dr. Hugh, Hugh, Dr. Hugh, just keep going, <laughs> uh, fan and lover, when there is a new character, are you trusting them? Are you not trusting them? What does it feel like when someone like this appears? Okay, well, let's get into the rogue of it all, right? We don't know his name. It does seem like that's a name, like maybe a moniker, right? The bounty hunter. Yeah. On first watch, when I watch this. I was like, I love this character. He's amazing. They need to get married. I don't care. Let's do this. Let's go. I'm sold. Watching it a second time, I'm cautious. Mm -hmm. I think there's a line that yeah. the that Rogue says when they're in the ship after Kylie Minogue and after all this stuff and the doctor commenting on all of his um, untidiness in there. There's something that he says. He says he mentions a new boss. The new boss, you know, wants blah, blah, blah or something. Yeah. He says this job has so much more paperwork since we got that new boss. The only other person that has said anything about a new boss or something like that is the Meep from the Star Beast mm -hmm. and also kind of inkling with the Maestro. There's this thing of something else is bigger running things. I don't know if that was just a line that peaked my ears and means nothing or it was something that we were supposed to catch i do find it interesting new boss for what usually a bounty hunter is like out on their own they're rogue you know they answer to no one so the fact that there's a boss i think that is an interesting line yeah there because we know there's this ominous figure somewhere waiting the one who waits what does that mean so that he's gave, waiting for paperwork <laughs> that gave me a little hmm interesting and I don't know if it's one of those situations where, you know, Rogue, his mission maybe is to hunt the trolders, but the doctor came and that's a bigger prize. And then he was like, oh, I'm just going to capture this guy or whatever. But then he actually did start having feelings. He was able to open up because that's the beautiful thing about this doctor is he's so open. He's so emotive. He's so just willing to like grab and touch and kiss and everything. And we haven't had that in a while. So I'm curious if that took away that facade almost. It, it's interesting. I don't know. <laughs> One of the things that I'm thinking about is we learned that he had a partner 
mm. at some point that he would travel through space with and do all these jobs with. But, you know, at first I thought, oh, the partner died. But maybe the partner didn't die. He just says, I woke up one day and like that was the end of that. So what happened to the partner? Mm. You know, did he do something to the partner? Did the partner not trust him anymore? You know, what would happen when you seem to be in this long term relationship? Why did it end? Yeah, he said his his words were a day came along. And at the end of that day, I lost them. And I guess that can be interpreted any type of way. It is interesting. I did like these moments because it is somebody that can relate on a level that nobody else can with the doctor. This guy travels, had a companion, lost them. This guy travels, lost a companion. You know, it's, so it's very much like that's their bonding. Mm. Um, is it true? Again, I feel like on the second watch, if you've only watched it once, I do recommend maybe watching it again because there are some things where it's like, mm, that's interesting. But then we get moments of when the scandalous thing of two men dancing in Bridgerton happens and the lights go out and the lights are just on them. There's moments where I'm like, I believe it. Like, I believe that there is an attraction, but there's something of both of them being like, this could be something. Can it? Mm -hmm. Should it? Is the question. I like that moment that they had in the TARDIS where, you know, he... Uh, the doctor says something like, will you travel to all these other planets with me? And then he says something like, well, we can go on my ship and you could do all these jobs with me. We can argue together. You know, so these two beings that are constantly traveling time and, and galaxies and stars, you know, how often is it that you find another male that's interested in men that does the same thing that you do? You know what I mean? Well, so hopefully outside of Earth, like sexuality is much more open. <laughs> fingers crossed, but I don't know, man. There are spacists. So like, I, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> and I don't think, and you know, going back to last episode, I don't think any of them people were queer neither. Well, no, probably not. That's what I'm saying. I do want to say, though, the... um. The one that played, I believe, Gothic Paul, mm -hmm. maybe, is the first trans man to be casted in Doctor Who. Incredible. So, yeah. Love that for them. Yeah. Hello, this season is just paving the way. Yeah, I love it. You know, Russell T. Davies did say, I'm going to be talking about this. I'm going to be doing this. I'm not going to be holding back. I'm going to be doing all these things. He's doing it. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're listening. Um, Which but, he does. <laughs> he does. But back to Rogue and the Doctor, did you find their chemistry to be believable or is there something that gave you pause? I think in the first watch, we're really digging down on the first and second watch in this. On the first watch, I didn't believe it so much. I felt like too much happened too quickly for me to really fully support it. I don't trust him for the doctor. I don't think they're a good match. <gasps> but <it's> Wait, <laughs> are you protective of the doctor? I don't want him to get hurt, which, by the way, OK, I'm, I'm just going to get into this now. The doctor needs therapy very, very badly, very badly. The, the only OK, yes. And I'm just saying this line because I feel like some listeners of Doctor Who would be like, Rod, this is supposed to be the doctor after all the therapy. So the bi regeneration happened and David Tennant kind of does all the therapy. And this is like after. OK, but that. when that and that's beautiful, but <laughs> you don't finish therapy. You don't graduate from therapy. I'm in therapy. There is no cap and gown ceremony. I'm just saying you I'm, just keep going, because what I noticed with this doctor is that something horrible happens. And then he's like, mm, 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 fold it up. And then I put it in a box. Well. Welcome to Doctor Who. I think that he could really do well with sitting down with someone it's, and talking about things. I, so you're specifically talking about like literally the last scene with mm. both of them. And he's like, okay, on to the next thing after rogue is gone, after everything happened, after he sent the ship into orbit and he's like, okay, next thing, like, let's not be sad. Let's go. What I did like though, is that Ruby took a minute and she was like, no, no, like you're saying this thing. I know you need a hug. And I loved that. I loved that. Like he let it happen because there are some doctors would just be like, rrr, rrr. like, okay, fine. We hugged. Okay, let's go. But he really kind of leaned into it, which is nice to see that even though he was going back to his old ways of running, he took a, a moment to be like, okay, yes, I let me think about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do also think about 
the doctor protecting himself because a lot of the beings that he comes in touch with, maybe something happens to them. And so he can't cry over every single person that he loses. He needs to kind of move on. He will try. Yeah. And Shuti's doctor has cried almost every episode. Yeah, because he keeps almost killing Ruby in every episode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I should say, he keeps getting into situations where yeah. Ruby almost dies yeah. in every episode. <laughs> He's not doing it. So shifting gears just a little bit, what did you think about the monsters, the villains, the aliens, the shoulder, shoulders? <laughs> well, Russell T. Davies is obviously saying that people that cosplay and go to cons take it too seriously and it's a life or death situation. That's... That is the social commentary of this episode. Well, he didn't write it, so let's just... That's true. Let's not blame him. You're right. You're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, I will say that Kate and Brainy think that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in, in all seriousness, so fun. Right. So cool. I mean, I don't know why bird cosplayers make lightning when they're sucking the life out of people, but I don't need to know why. Right. Because I thought it was so outlandish and delightful. Yeah, I agree. I, I do find it funny that their whole game plan was to like start here at this ball and then take over the world. But I love that they're not subtle at all. Like it does seem like they're just playing and they don't give a shit because they would just lightning, which is I like it because it's different. It'd be one thing to just like hold somebody and do like a rogue and just like suck their essence and their look. But the lightning made it like, okay, this is like different, not subtle mm -mm. at all. So that was fun. Um, I thought they looked fantastic. That is one thing with all of these episodes so far is the quality has not dipped in the costuming and the effects and the sound and the music. It has all have been so consistent. Watch Older Who and it's like, this, that looked weird, but this fantastic. I love the way they looked. Yeah, I was really marveling over. Obviously, they were each based on a different type of bird. And I was marveling at the feather work on their faces. I mean, their cowls that they were wearing had full, you know, single feathers in it. It wasn't just like something that was painted on. You can tell there was real feathers there. I mean, it was incredible. Yeah. And I believe Pam Down had did the costuming for this season. I believe they just kind of did the whole thing. I think they got the Bridgerton look down perfectly there could have been more extravagant wigs but i'm just i'm sure the wig budget is like not in it for doctor Who. But yeah the, i mean and the the extravagant extravagant wigs are for the queen when she's there so they didn't have a queen here right <laughs> but i think that they must have the prosthetics on the shoulders probably cost a lot and i also like the idea of them being like okay so you need to dress all these extras um, and then we have some uh, bird humanoids that also need to be in Bridgerton garb. Why not? And I agree. <laughs> Why I, not? What a creative uh, task for her to have to tackle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So getting into kind of the conclusion of this episode. So they are cosplayers. They love the drama. They feed off of it. They can't help but expose themselves, the shoulders, with drama. So after the scandalous gay dance of two men and then creating a scene and proposing the proposal the proposal which i loved how it took the doctor by surprise he kept trying to get rogue to play into it and then when he got on the knee the doctor was like oh that felt real to me the proposal it did feel real which is interesting i know ahead of this episode we had asked and everything on on social media like any final thoughts or anything like you think is going to happen in the show and a lot of people were like it's going to be another Time Lord. It's going to be a fugitive doctor. It's going to be another incarnation of the doctor. It's going to be this and that. And that would have been interesting. But as far as we know, it's not. So the fact that like he did do that to create a scene, but how personal it felt is interesting. And especially when the doctor, what they were playing up in that scene was kind of the scandal of it all. Like, I'm not going to give up my life for you. And for a rogue to go in the complete opposite direction of getting down on one knee and making it a tender moment. He, the doctor literally says before he does that, tell me what your heart wants or I will turn my back on you forever. And then he gets on his knee. <sighs> and we were trying to. So because of how we watch this episode, there is a big like kind of watermark um, on the on the episode. So behind the scenes stuff. We had a hard time seeing what was on the ring because, of course, the watermark was right there. I think 
it's a dagger, which is like rogue dagger. It looks like a dagger, but it's it's a very weird looking dagger. So if any of you got a better look at it while listening to this episode, let us know what you think that is. It's a it's a Susan twist. It's a spring. It does look like a twist, though. Right. There's always a twist at the end. Dun, dun, dun. Whoa. Mm-hmm. Mm. But seeing them run around holding hands. Ugh. It was just, you know, as a queer Doctor Who fan, seeing the Doctor really fully be queer in this moment, we almost got it. We almost got it with 13 and Yaz. There's a moment in Jodie Whittaker's season where they're, they're, they're at their like kind of end of whatever's happening with the show. And Yaz tells her feelings to her. And the Doctor's like, I would be with you. But because of the episode and because of everything happening, she knows she can't. So it's like we almost got like that queer relationship mm. in Doctor Who. So to, to finally see some form of that actually be acted out made me very happy. And not to go too blue right now, but I feel like there was a lot of play on like sort of, I don't know, things like men having a pissing contest, right? It was kind of like the doctor's like, well, I have my sonic screwdriver. And he's like, well, I have a big pistol. And he's like, what's that shed? He's like, that's my ship. He's like, I'll show you a ship. Yeah. Look at my big it's ship. flirting. Yeah. And then they go in and he's like, your ship's disgusting. It's a mess. Yeah. He's like, let's go into my ship. And he's like, now this is a ship sleek, sturdy, but it does make some weird noises every once in a while. Ignore it. Yeah. But something's up with the TARDIS, obviously still. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's doing that weird groaning thing. It did. It did make a really weird noise, which he was like, oh, it just doesn't like the ethicalness of whatever's happening. I don't believe that mm-hmm. something's weird with the TARDIS. Yeah. But I appreciated all the little word play about their ships and their weapons and things like that and what they can do. Yeah. And obviously the rogue is also a bit of a geek because he plays Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's something about him. Like, what is his deal? The, the mystery of the rogue is still there, but we're peeling it back piece by piece, trying to figure it out. Agreed. So spaceship sizes aside, queerness aside. I liked the bait and switch of this episode. I thought they did a really good job because one, I think they played with us a little too much of like Ruby screaming and we seeing the lightning. I was like, oh, damn, he actually got her. And it with it being so close to the end of this season, I was like, this can't be how like Ruby, like she can't die this way. How is he going to get her back? It wasn't it was the, the earrings like helped her, but. In that moment when he realizes, oh, my God, this is Ruby. She's not gone. What do I do? Impossible decisions for the doctor. It's like the chef's kiss of the series. But also, I hate seeing him in those situations. It's like he's got to learn to make devices where he doesn't have just one chance to do things. You know what I mean? When he's fixing the device, making it big enough instead of one person to six people, he's like, "Okay, but you only have one chance. I'm like. Doctor, you got to stop doing this. You know, it's for us. It's for the stakes. Is it for us? Because well, I find it frustrating because I think they're just going to kill Ruby and they don't care. Them showing that flashback with him talking to Carla and she's like, promise me that you'll keep her safe. And he's like, yeah, I, I promise. How dare you? You know what? He Rude. Should, yeah. He should learn to stop leaving Ruby by herself. <laughs> he had a hot Jonathan Groff. I think every once in a while. You know, look, a good gay should find their bestie and always just check on her and make sure she's okay. That's true. Right? But she did survive like decades by herself. Oh, did he doesn't she? know that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> she had those goblins following her around for a while. She's yeah. not had an easy life. She- <laughs> and then that lady. Oh, my God. <laughs> Susan Twist. The, uh, she's around still. Yeah. Oh, my God. Do you think that we will see Rogue again? Do you think he's going to find him if he's actually lost? Okay, you, so this would be, I think, homophobic because you cannot give us the first fully queer Doctor Who kiss and then have it never happen again. True. And have that love interest completely disappear. Yeah, I hope for the doctor's sake he does find him. I think he's going to be wearing that ring. I think he's going to be twisting it. I think he's going to put Kylie Minogue on that little jukebox inside the TARDIS and he's going to be thinking about him constantly. Oh, sad. Come on, Uh, sending his ship up to the moon. He should get in the ship, dig around, find his real name out, maybe do some DNA tracing or something like that. He should, but we have two episodes left (laughs) and we don't have time for that. Uh, Yeah. Ridiculous. So final thoughts on this episode. I really enjoyed it. 
Bridgerton of it all, the acting, the moments of the doctor in complete distress and making those decisions. Will you, you know, sacrifice your friend to save the world? Why are you asking him that? And for him to say no. I mean, he's at the point where he's like, how many companions, how many best friends have I lost? People that I've loved. I can't keep doing this. Yeah. Uh, I love I, I love it. You know, I think this episode came at the right time before we get into the two parter. Yeah, I think that thinking about the rogue character, kind of tying up my thoughts on him in that moment where he's kissing the doctor, we're all thinking that he's going to press the button and send Ruby to that other universe. But what he does is he ends up sacrificing himself and he says, find me. So maybe Rogue doesn't actually know who he's working for in the sense of he know he's he knows he has a new boss, but he doesn't know what he's doing and that he's out to get the doctor in some way. So we can trust Rogue, but Rogue doesn't know that he can't trust who he's working for. Yeah, it's interesting. And Rogue did see his true nature. He did see that he was a Time Lord and his other faces or their other faces. Oh, there was a moment and another moment that I keep thinking about Rogue. Like, I hope he's good and I hope maybe he wasn't good. And he's like, I the doctor changed me in some way. But when he saw David Tennant's face, he just went. He like gave a weird look, like he immediately took his, his finger off. Like that was the person that was the face that we saw or whoever and was like, find this person. And maybe once he saw that, he was like, that's the person I'm supposed to find. Or, or was that doctor the person he was traveling the stars with? Was he once a companion? Mm. And one day How dare. he was gone. How dare he never say anything about him? I mean, that's true. That's a good point, too. It does happen. There's adventures he's always traveling, so stuff that we haven't seen. Oh, so much. So going off of the next time for the penultimate episode of Doctor Who, season 14, season one, whatever you want to call it. What do you think? I think we're going to finally get some answers. We have to. Right? It starts with, there's this woman, she's following me everywhere I go, and we see Susan Twist, and it seems like she's on some type of like stage or like... There's an audience that can watch whatever's happening. And she's like, it's always in my dreams or I can't remember the exact words, but we get a flash of like her face changing into some weird like black crowned thing. Is Susan Twist an author and they're stuck in her intergalactic book? <laughs> right? Yeah, maybe. Because they're always seeing her and she's like, they're always there. It's always there. Yeah. Oof. It looks like Yuna is definitely involved. We saw Kate. We saw Bush. We saw all of them. Kate Bush was no. also there. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Kylie Minogue, there. <laughs> Lady Gaga, there. <laughs> there. <laughs> oh, there's so much. So let us know. Send your thoughts at us. DM us. abonipples at gmail.com. What are your thoughts going into the finale? <sighs> Two weeks left, guys. I can't believe it. Mm -hmm. That's another end. All right. Oh. So until next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.